Hi everybody and welcome back to the Frontiers North Adventures and Polar Bears International Tundra Buggy 1. We are on the shores of Hudson Bay just outside of Churchill, Manitoba and we are watching a polar bear mom and cub and for those of you that have been watching for a while you've seen them um, right outside our window here and it is quite a blowy blowy day out there at the moment so there's not um, the best view oh yep they're pretty covered in snow <laughs> it might be difficult to see um, but we are here to chat today about polar bears but also about belugas so we have this fantastic tundra buggy one polar bear cam thanks to support by Frontiers North and Explore.org. And there's other cams all over the Churchill area. So maybe you have seen uh, the lodge cams on the Frontiers North Adventures Tundra Buggy Lodge, North and South, and then the Cape Churchill cams in Wapusk National Park. We've also got a Northern Lights cam on the Churchill Northern Study Center. Um, but in the summer, when it's a little less chilly out here, we have beluga whales and a beluga whale cam. And we get fantastic audio from the beluga whale cam and it's one of our favorite cams it is just great and so today we are very lucky to be joined by dr valeria vergara did i say that right yes. okay <laughs> who studies beluga whales and she has studied beluga whales all over the north and spent uh, her first summer in churchill this last summer uh, with the belugas of the churchill river and so we have been doing our educational outreach all week here on buggy one um, and we like to bring up a variety of experts not only about polar bears or sea ice but also about belugas which are another species that depends on arctic sea ice for survival um, so we thought it would be perfect to have valeria up as a guest and thought it would be really neat to as we're starting to wrap up this polar bear season already be foreshadowing the beluga season and amping up for that cam even though it's a few months away. Um, so I would like to start by asking you about belugas and they are so acoustic. They are just the chattiest whales and uh, that's what you study. That is right. Let me um, let you hear a little clip of what, we're, uh, what, what we hear when we study beluga sounds. That's amazing. What is happening in that clip? So that was uh, um, a group of young males. Males tend to band together. They form long-term associations and friendships. Um, and they are extremely vocal. Both males and females are extremely uh, vocal. But in this case, you were hearing young males. And there was a lot of echolocation in that clip. All of those buzz-sounding sounds uh, where echolocation clicks, which they use to navigate and to find prey. They use communication sounds to stay in touch with one another. And uh, if you imagine a world where for in, in the high Arctic for six months of the year, it is dark, the sun doesn't come up. And uh, in other areas <clears throat> in the summer, the sun is up, but it can be very turbid. So for a species that is incredibly social, the glue of their society is sound. They rely on sounds to stay in touch with one another, to communicate for mothers and calves specifically, to be in, in, in acoustic contact with one another is, is crucial in an underwater world. So this is why it's important to study their, their communication. And how are they making these sounds? I mean, they're just beautiful. What's going on there? That's a really good question. Belugas do not make sounds through their vocal, so through, they don't have vocal cords. They don't make sounds through their mouths. They, we can say that they make sounds through their noses because they have a couple of fatty muscular structures um, just below the blowhole that are called the monkey lips. And they're called monkey lips because they resemble the lips of a monkey. They really do. And they open and close very, very fast creating pulses, letting air through um, this opening and closing of these pulses and directing this, and this makes sounds that they direct through a fatty acoustic lens that uh, is essentially their melon. Their melon or forehead is filled with this, um, 
this fatty fluid that acts as an acoustic lens and they can move their melanin direct the sound uh, to to the intended receiver. Now, are there, we have a question coming in already. Um, do whales of different species also understand each other's vocalizations? Is this specific to belugas? That is such a good question. And we have a feeling that whales that have evolved in the same environment might be able to understand each other's vocalizations because sounds, Im sounds essentially evolve to work and to be transmitted properly in the environments in which the animals are a part of. So narwhal make very similar sounds to belugas. And in fact, we often see pots of narwhal and pots of beluga swimming uh, together. They are occasionally known to interbreed, producing uh, offspring that are co called uh, nerlugas. <laughs> this, uh, this year in the St. Lawrence River Estuary, which is the southernmost population of beluga whales, we had one narwhal swimming with a pot of beluga for about two weeks. Uh, so if they swim together and socialize together and go as far as mating, they probably make sounds that are not just similar, but that they can understand. Um, we don't know if um, belugas would understand the sounds of, of other species, but we do know that s prey species understand the sounds of predators. So. We know that belugas understand the sounds that killer whales make because killer whales prey on beluga. And so it's adaptive, it's beneficial for belugas to know very well what a killer whale sounds like so that they can, they can leave the area when they hear killer whales coming. That is fascinating. Uh, we have another question about how long do belugas live in the wild? Uh, so they, uh, we know now that they can live up to 70 years. They um, have very long lifespans. That is really, really neat. Could you t maybe talk a bit about some of your most interesting findings? As you're understanding these vocalizations, can you actually tell them apart? Uh, what's going on here? Absolutely. So one of the main vocalizations that I found quite early in my career was the maternal, the mother calf contact call, which is essential for, for mothers and, and little calves to, to stay together underwater. And these contact calls are also used by adults, in, in, so between an adult and an adult, uh, not necessarily just by mothers and calves, um, to maintain contact in situations where contact is essential. For example, if, they get, if an adult gets separated from the rest of the group. I was here in July studying mother-calf contact calls in Churchill, because Churchill is um, these, it's, a, it's an estuary, it's a submarine uh, area for the Hudson Bay, Western Hudson Bay beluga population where mothers bring their young calves um, to socialize them, to nurse them. Um, they also give birth uh, up in the, in the Churchill River occasionally. And this clip that you're about to hear um, was recorded in Mosquito Point, about four or five kilometers up the Churchill River. And it is a maternal, the typical maternal contact call that beluga wh whales <coughs> produce just the moment their calves are born. Oh, wow. And after that, they produce this call to maintain contact with their very newborn calves. It, it's got a, it's a contact call that has a bit of a different pitch. Um, and this is what it sounds like. So you could, pr you were probably able to tell that there were some typical beluga whistles and chirps, and a constant, repetitive sound that sounded a little bit like a whine. Wah, wah. That is a maternal contact call, and contact calls in all species of social birds and mammals whose vocaliz vocalizations have been studied, are they can be, they can be teased apart from the background chatter of the species. They cut through the chatter, um, and this serves a very functional role. That is 
just so fascinating. And for anyone joining us that may be tuned in to watch the Polar Bear Cam and are hearing these incredible vocalizations and wondering what the heck are we doing out here? Um, just for anyone new, we are speaking today with Dr. Valeria Vergara, who is a pol uh, beluga researcher who's done some work here in the Churchill River. And we are uh, already, as polar bear season is winding down, we're looking forward to beluga whale season. Uh, so we thought we'd learn some of this stuff today. And we're just fascinated because those viewers that um, maybe listen to the belugas on the explore.org beluga cam in the summer um, are likely hearing all sorts of things going on that we don't we have no idea what it is. And so to get a little insight here is just incredible. Uh, if you'd like to, um, for example, listen to a few aggressive calls, um, let's see if I, we can play them. <laughs> so when belugas uh, are getting into little fights with one another, uh, they sound very different than animals that growl or that bark. That was a typical sound associated with beluga chases, when belugas chase one another, like get out of here, and they get into little, little scuffles. Um, then the next one is a series of jaw claps followed by, by aggressive sounds. So it's really like a clap, like, like a clap like that, followed by a little open mouth threat. Um, it's, it's, uh, they're not super loud, but they, they are always associated with, with aggressive events. Then the next one is also aggression, and this one is also associated with chases. So that's kind of like a, don't bother me, get away. <laughs> and then the last one, it's uh, called a directed gaze, or also associated with open mouth uh, threats. So very different than, the, than uh, the type of aggressive vocalizations you would hear from other species. And you will learn these things by associating behaviors to vocalizations for years and years and then putting them together. When you put the same behavior with the same vocalization over and over and over again uh, together, you learn to, to associate um, these things. So someone has a question, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Uh, so if belugas, say, live for 70 years, um, are they kind of keeping this language of theirs for 70 years? Like they're, this is always their aggression call, always their contact call. Is This is kind of how they speak throughout their lives? So we believe um, that's the case, but we haven't followed the the vocal development of a whale from day one to, to age 70. I wish we could. That would be a phenomenal project. Um, and in fact, for bottlenose dolphins, for example, which is another species for which people have studied their sounds, uh, p uh, scientists have looked at the stability of their, of their names, of their signature whistles, the whistles that they use to identify themselves. And now, in my work, I've discovered that belugas also have signature whistles or names. So each beluga makes a particular contact call that is specific to only that um, whale. And one of the things to look at is whether this contact call is stable throughout life. Uh, what we do know is that beluga calves are not born knowing all the very rich, uh, beautiful and diverse repertoire of sounds uh, that adult belugas make. They are born making only one little sound, much like human babies, and then slowly they begin to learn the rest of the sounds of their repertoire, uh, presumably from when they hear other adults in their group making these sounds. Uh, so it, it, takes, it takes a while for belugas to adopt, the, to develop their entire repertoire, and whether that repertoire is the same as uh, at 70 years of age or not, it's an open question. This is so fascinating because it's one thing we don't get a lot from polar bears. There's not a lot of vocalizations that we're able to hear. And so to be able to have all these data and start understanding the language of belugas is just so cool. Are you able to speak a little bit about the Churchill belugas in particular, the, this population that's around here and how they compare to other belugas maybe? Well, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Churchill uh, belugas are, it's, uh, the Churchill River estuary is one of the three summering areas for the western, uh, western um, Hudson Bay population. 
this population has very high numbers, 57,000. Uh, it's still considered a special concern because we need to know a lot more about about them and about their habitat than, than we currently know. But if we think of the total number of belugas around the world at around 200,000 or something like that, then Churchill makes up a very large uh, portion of that number. They're very abundant, especially in the Churchill River estuary. So when you're a beluga biologist trying to understand their communication and you put a hydrophone in the water, and you have suddenly 400 whales, quite li literally, surrounding that hydrophone, it, uh, you, you get thousands upon, upon thousands of vocalizations. Um, my research assistant and I anal just started analyzing the data from, um, from this summer in Churchill. Uh, and our project this time around, by the way, was funded um, by WWF and, and DFO in collaboration with the, the Vancouver Aquarium. And in two days of Churchill data, we found over 2,000 maternal contact calls. Oh this is just in two days of data. We need to so analyze, oh yeah. And we need to analyze the rest of the 20 days. So analyzing acoustic data takes a very long time. It takes a lot of patience. You really want, you have to love what you do. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so lots, lots of, lots of uh, good data uh, you can obtain in Churchill. And uh, another great thing about studying communication in Churchill is that you can find different groups quite easily doing different things. You can find groups of mothers and young calves uh, sort of sticking to themselves uh, in an area called, for example, Mosquito Point up the river. You can find feeding herds. Um, of three, four hundred animals down down river, you can find groups of uh, all adult males. And when you record these different groups, and you use a, a little drone to film their behavior and make sure that you understand group composition from the air, you start having an idea of what different groups and different activities sound like acoustically. And this helps us inform passive acoustic monitoring studies. Um, so it's it's a uh, it's important work. This yeah, this is just incredible. We've been so fascinated. It's been great to have our beluga cam out, but then to actually find and work with people that are studying these animals and uh, because of course at Polar Bears International we do focus on polar bears uh, but we think it's important that we are paying attention to all the animals that use the Arctic as a home uh, and maybe could you briefly talk about why belugas need Arctic sea ice why they're an ice dependent whale absolutely so belugas have evolved in the Arctic for thousands of years the changes that are taking place in the Arctic are um, are very very rapid and these changes, changes are, um, might not be giving enough time to species to adapt this rapidly to these changes. Now, in some cases, we do see um, species adapting to these changes. In the case of beluga whales, for instance, they have shifted diets in a number of populations. Um, up here in Churchill, uh, uh, scientists have found that they've shifted uh, from uh, Arctic sea-dependent species a little bit like uh, like Hollywood or, or Arctic uh, char to more temperate species like capelin. And we are not sure what effect this is going to have on their nutrition. Um, another thing that is happening with the Arctic ice is that we are losing it at a, at a tremendous uh, speed. And so the Arctic is opening up to all sorts of human activities. Um, and with this come noise. and. Uh, we all know, know as humans that noisy, com noisy places can be stressful, that if an ambulance is passing by and we're having a dialogue, we stop talking until the ambulance is far away enough that we can resume talking. For marine mammals, for cetaceans that rely on sound for pretty much every aspect of their lives, sound can be noise, can be a really, really significant problem. Uh, so an increase in, in uh, noise in the oceans uh, is, is uh, 
is one of the problems associated with changes in Arctic ice. And it's one of the things that I'm exploring. How does this uh, noise affect the ability of belugas to communicate efficiently, to forage efficiently? That is such important work. Uh, and it's so interesting that, um, I'm sorry, I'm just reading these explore comments, that there there are some similarities with polar bears and belugas. And again, for anyone joining us there, we are doing a voiceover right now about belugas, even though we are looking at a polar bear. Um, but these two species are so fascinating. They are both um, Arctic marine mammals who depend on sea ice in different ways and are going through changes with that. Um, some of the polar bear changes that we're seeing as a result of sea ice declining due to warming climate um, is that is also communication. So belugas, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. We were talking about it yesterday. And, and for polar bears, I think a lot of you know that polar bears are very scent-focused animals. So they're using their nose to navigate all over the place. Um, and while sea ice is most important for their food, it is really important for communication for polar bears too. Polar bears um, will smell each other out on the sea ice. And in particular, females who are ready to mate will leave a scent trail in their footprints. And if you think about what it might be like finding a mate in the vast Arctic landscape it would be pretty difficult we're looking at a huge area and not a ton of polar bears it might be hard to bump into each other out there sometimes and so when a female is ready to meet she does leave a scent trail in her footprints that a male can smell on the air he can navigate to those footprints and he can follow those footprints uh, for days if he has to until he finds the female now imagine that you've been tracking a potential mate for a couple days in the footprints and then all of a sudden they just disappear because the ice has broken and drifted away and that's what we're seeing more of uh, we are seeing overall declines but also just thinning ice and when you have ice that's a bit thinner it blows around more it breaks up more and uh, we're losing these kind of scent trails out there so that's going to be an interesting thing to study for polar bears in the future as well um, how their communication is affected as well as their diet. And, and Valeria, what what are the belugas eating and is that is that different depending on where they are in the Arctic? I imagine it would be a little different. They are opportunistic feeders. They um, it tend to feed on, bo on bottom dwell dwelling uh, species. Um, anything from uh, mollusks to uh, capelin to Arctic char, Arctic cod, um, halibut, sand lance, um, you name it. Really variety of very, different very things. Large, very large uh, variety of of species, they um, will sometimes search the undersurface of the uh, of the ice uh, for little uh, mollusks that attach there. We've seen them in Cunningham Inlet in the high Arctic sift through the sandy bottoms to eat whatever little creatures uh, might hide there. Um, they really do have something like over a hundred different species of prey they can rely on. Oh my God. That's a big difference with polar bears who mainly eat ringed and bearded seals, even though they will snack on other things. But they will. They, they will even snack on belugas sometimes. <laughs> yeah, could you talk about that a little bit maybe? You know? Absolutely. So, so uh, polar bears, I mean, belugas are a really difficult prey to catch for polar bears. But if belugas get stranded at low tide, and and um, and that happens in very shallow estuaries, I have seen this happening in Cunningham Inlet, where the beluga are rolling around in the shallows. Uh, presumably they find this, um, uh, this is an important behavior to, to help with skim molting, and they are not able to time the low tide, they get stuck. So if they get distracted during this molting process, they get stuck. And they need to wait for the high tide to come back to get out of these of these stranded situations. And if there are polar bears in the area, they have been known to feed on beluga whales. I watched one of these strandings in 2014 in Cunningham Inlet, and at the time, the belugas got out successfully with no bears in the area. But that's not usually the case. And one of the things that's happening with global warming is the, with, with the shifting ice patterns, there are more beluga entrapments in, in ice holes. And when this happens, polar bears will uh, come to the edge of these ha ice holes and literally fish beluga out of the ice holes. They are very strong animals and they can uh, take a small beluga out of an ice hole with just sheer strength. Um, and so these entrapments, these ice entrapments are happening a little bit more often 
with the with the shifting ice patterns is amazing. I, I remember one time a few years ago when I lived here, um, there were a couple of killer whales that came into the bay that one year that we saw. Um, and all the belugas really crammed up the rivers into the very, very shallow water to get away. And you showed, um, and I know people can't see it now, but uh, Valeria was showing me, or showing us a video the other night of the way the belugas can kind of navigate in these shallow waters. And it was amazing. Yeah, it's it's it, it is so cool that my um, my research uh, colleagues and I call it caterpillaring, <laughs> because it really looks like a, a, a worm that is inching its way or a caterpillar inching its way through the mat. We are talking belugas <laughs> traversing areas that are not deeper than two feet. The half of their body, you see half of their bodies out of the water. Um, so very, very shallow water species. Killer whales cannot reach them in those shallows, which might be one of the reasons why belugas use uh, estuaries during the summer when they have very, very young babies with them. That makes sense. Um, and as part of that, we flew up to the Seal River. So much for um, all your chats today. And again, I want to build some context. If you're watching the polar bear cam right now, uh, you're seeing a lot of white. But I promise you, under that little overhang of snow, <laughs> there is a mom and cub. And occasionally they're moving. They're hard to see. Uh, we are having crazy gusty winds right now. And, you know, BJ, many of you who know BJ that watch the cams, he has left us in buggy one with the window open right now. So we're pretty cold. He's gone to visit another buggy for a minute that we're docked up to. We are going to be having another live chat here pretty soon. Um, it was scheduled for a couple hours from now, but we might end up doing it a little sooner. So we're going to be talking about um, drones and tags and how we track polar bears throughout the Arctic in different ways and why that's important for polar bear conservation. And so thank you so much to Valeria today. And thank you for your questions. We just love belugas. We're really hoping that we see you next summer. Oh, me too. Yes, it will be <laughs> great. Um, and we'll get you out on um, the explore.org boat maybe Absolutely. more often. That would be fast. If you that are interested, uh, you can also check out the um, Beluga Citizen Science Project that is posted on Explore. And we can reshare that out um, if you're interested in helping us snort, uh, sort through those snapshots um, online. So the wonderful Explore viewers that are taking snapshots of the underwater Beluga Cam on the, on the Beluga Cam, uh, we are actually using those snapshots to help us understand a bit more about Beluga. Um, structure, population structure and things like that in the river. So very cool. So make sure you get involved with that if you're interested. Um, but yeah, we still do have a couple weeks of polar bear viewing. Uh, many of you may know that it is a good year for polar bears this year, it seems like. Um, of course, when we look over long-term trends, we do see that um, ice is declining, but there is still a lot of interannual variation. And this year, we are seeing some great cold variation, and so the ice is here a bit early. So it is a little bit slower for polar bears at the moment, but that's really good for polar bears. A lot of them are already out there hunting, so we're super excited. Um, but we do have this mom and cub, and I think there's one more in the area. We might go try to find later. And as always, we are here um, on Buggy One driving around. We're in the comments. We're on Facebook. So let us know if you have any questions. And we'll try to get you the best views we have out here. And we sure appreciate um, everyone tuning in and listening. So thank you so much, Valeria. Thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah, really nice chatting with all of you today. A bit of a beluga teaser. And now we'll go back. Oh, we see someone peeking out of the oh, snow there. Yeah. See, I told you it was a polar bear. <laughs> So we'll stay here for a while. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.